I have the great honor of um, presenting Alf Hornbock to you, a Swedish, um, I would say polymath is the best description because he's doing a very transdisciplinary approach towards uh, ecological thinking. Um, his title is Professor for Human Ecology at Lund University. Um, his fields cover, I wrote down some names, ecology, economics, anthropology, history, semiotics, philosophy, even physics. And um, <laughs> so be prepared for something here. Um, and he's publishing and working for more than 30 years on very interesting topics. And we'll hear some results which are extremely interested for a very political approach on our ecological problem we're facing, sometimes called the Anthropocene. Um, we will talk about something he calls machine fetishism, um, then maybe briefly get into a critique on some stance that could be summarized as post-humanism, and round up with an uh, actual kind of concrete proposal for a solution, although we already decided that the difficult word. <laughs> um, so without further ado, um, <laughs> Thank you very much. Let's see if this... Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Kilian and, and, and Band and so on for inviting me, and, and I want to thank you all for coming tonight. I'm extremely impressed. I mean, this beautiful city of Vienna, how can you, how can you sort of go indoors an evening like this? I'm, I'm, I'm extremely uh, impressed and, and, and proud. Um, and actually, for me, coming from Sweden, it's fantastic to see all these green leaves and so on. I just told Kilian these were the first leaves I've seen this year. I come from up north. Um, yeah, I want to talk about technology. And, um, and we're surrounded, we just noticed we're surrounded by technology. I mean, here's one piece, here's another piece. I must admit I flew here this morning from, from Sweden in an airplane. And of course, very little of what we all do would be possible without technology. It's so much a part of our everyday life that we hardly reflect on it. And um, that is probably one of the reasons why I, for the past 35 years, basically, have been trying to understand the mystery of technology, because I do think technology is a mystery. We're living with it, we're surrounded by it, and we have a lot of preconceptions, a lot of assumptions about technology uh, that I think need to be unpacked. And um, I would like to begin by asking you to look at, at these images, because what I will be saying will be very abstract. I will be talking in very general ways about what makes technology possible. And I'm talking about technology as a general global phenomenon, not just the particular microphone or the particular computer. There are thousands of case studies of, of bicycles and, and steam engines and whatever specific kinds of technologies we can come up with. Uh, and they're certainly valuable, but I think we also need to take a step back and look at technology as a total phenomenon. Now, these two images, if I begin with the bottom image, you can probably see it's a, it's a composite satellite image of nighttime lights. So it's what the world looks like from outer space. Uh, of course, it can't be photographed by one satellite. It's a, it's a combination of several satellite pictures. Um, as you can see, the distribution of lighting in the world is highly unequal. And uh, it is this inequality or unevenness in the distribution of technology that I want to problematize and theorize. The top map has been compiled by economists. It shows the um, density of GDP, that is, in normal language, how much money is being made per square kilometer in the world. So the most 
crimson areas of the, of the world map are the areas where most money is made per square kilometer. So the two maps, if you want to put it really simply, show the distribution of money and the distribution of technology. And what I want to emphasize is that the two maps are almost identical. If you look at them systematically, you will see that where there is money, there is technology. And where there is technology, there is money. And I think it's interesting to ask ourselves why the study of money and the study of technology are kept so insulated from each other. In every university we have se separate faculties for the study of economics and the study of engineering, as if they were completely different phenomena. And I will be arguing that they're actually two sides of the same coin. That economics and technology are really about the same reality. And as you can see, in both cases we're talking about distribution, global distribution. Um, let me begin by talking in very physicalist, almost natural science terms about the requirements of modern technology. We can show, in terms of empirical data, that the distribution of technology in the world, modern technology, I will get into a definition of technology soon, and please do uh, interrupt me if you think I'm not clear, because I've been talking about this for so long that I don't know when I'm missing a step in my argument. So please don't hesitate to stop me. But anyway, what I want to show is that there is an asymmetric, I use the word asymmetric rather than unequal because it's more precise. There are asymmetric global flows of biophysical resources that make technology possible, but that economists cannot see. They are invisible to economists. And I'll try to explain how that is possible. Uh, the, four, the four measures or the four kinds of resources that I want to focus on are embodied labor, embodied land, embodied energy, and embodied materials. I know this sounds very physicalist and so on, but we'll get into the uh, social science aspects of this in a little while. Uh, a friend of mine, a colleague, is actually from Austria, Christian Dorninger. He used to work with uh, Marina Fischer-Kowalski. You may be aware of her work on material flow analysis. Uh, Christian and I published a piece in Ecological Economics two years back where, well, he did most of the work. He, he showed using global databases that the three most, uh, the three most techno technologically and economically advanced areas of the world, and here I'll just momentarily go back to this map, the United States, the European Union, and Japan, all have net imports of all the four resources that I mentioned. And this applies to the year 2007. There is empirical evidence that in terms of these four metrics, these three areas of the world have a net import. A net, there's a net inflow of embodied labor, embodied land, embodied energy, and embodied materials. Now, this is the first of four diagrams, and I'll pass through them quickly because diagrams are boring. But uh, this is just to show how Christian uh, visualized this. Uh, you can see that in each diagram you have the three areas, EU, the European Union, Japan, and the USA. And the first gray, the gray column is imports, the black column is exports, and the white column is net imports. So it's the gray column minus the black column, right? Now, 
as, as <coughs> whenever, whenever there's a black column, in other words, there's a net import of this particular resource. Now, you probably ask, how do you measure this? Well, what, the people, what they've done, the material flow analysts, is they, they translate trade statistics based in money measures into statistics based on biophysical measures. So they have ways of, trans, of translating uh, dollar, trade in dollars into trade in tons. Or in this case, if we're talking about labor, it's person year equivalents. Now, uh, let's just stay for one minute with this, these two diagrams. The left-hand diagram shows um, the total import of embodied labor to these three areas. The right-hand diagram shows per capita, per person. And if you can just look at the three columns for the United States of America furthest to the right. And you can, you can see that per capita there is a net import of 0 0.3 person year equivalents per year. Right? That means that for every average American citizen what this citizen consumes in one year corresponds to uh, one-third of a full year of labor somewhere else in the world, a person-year equivalent. This is the amount of labor time that has been embodied in the produce that is consumed by an average American. So, just to draw one simple conclusion, which is pretty enlightening. If you have a very small American household with average economy, two young people who move together and have their first child, in other words, a three-person household, you have to multiply 0 0.33 person-year equivalents by three, and you can show that such a little household has one full-time servant working for it, outside the United States. If they had four children, they would have two full-time servants. Now, this is an average family. It's not a wealthy family. It's an average American family. Okay, this is just to give you an example of what these <coughs> diagrams actually illustrate. And the interesting thing is, the economists don't have a clue about it or at least they pretend not to. Um, I hope there are not too many economists in the audience because I'll be provoking you guys. Okay. Um, I just want to very briefly show that the same pattern you can find whether it comes to embodied land. Now, in this case, I would like you to look at Japan as an interesting example. Uh, the gray, if you look at the right-hand diagram, uh, the gray column again shows the net import of embodied land per capita for each Japanese in the year 2000. And as you can see, it's around one hectare. Now, export, as you can see, is very, very, very small. So 99% of this import is also a net import. So in other words, every Japanese citizen imports uh, almost one hectare of embodied land in the commodities that are imported to Japan. And once again, this is something that doesn't show up in economist statistics. We can say the same thing about energy. Once again, you see these white columns in every diagram and about materials. And I won't get into more details, but I hope I've made my point that beyond the glasses that economists use to look at reality, and we'll talk about that shortly. There is a physical, a biophysical reality that tells us that what we consider the product of engineering, of progress, social progress ever since the Industrial Revolution, what we think of as the product of human ingenuity exclusively, is also, I'm not saying instead, I'm saying also the product 
of asymmetric global exchange. It's a phenomenon of political economy. And I, my big problem, my big conundrum, my big paradox that I've been working on for so long, trying to grasp, is how this reality has really escaped us so completely. Because most people, when I argue about machine fetishism, that technology is really a form of capital accumulation that occurs at the expense of other people who don't have technology, most people will just shake their heads and say, well, nothing. So, for me, it's a big mystery how we can, how we can live with technology and, and see it accumulating more and more around us, but how unwilling we are to see that it's part of a global exploitation of, of the people, perhaps the two and a half billion people who have to live on less than two dollars a day. Uh, we know that there are a lot of poor people around, but we, we cannot connect that to the phenomenon of technology. Okay. Uh, this, this diagram simply, um, oh, I should be speeding up, I guess. Oh. <laughs> this diagram summarizes uh, the data that Christian compiled for that article. And for those of you who are into numbers, uh, you can see the figures here. Um, uh, the USA, for example, uh, imported in 2007 3.7 gigatons of materials, 10.6 exajoule of energy, 1.1 million square kilometers of embodied land, and 96 million person years of embodied labor. So the <coughs> empirical evidence is there. Now, what sense can we make of this? Um, for a long time, I was struggling with trying to understand technology as if it was either a product of ingenuity, like James Watt when he uh, designed the steam engine, or if it was a product of political economy, of capital accumulation. But I think we need to see that technology is both. You can't have technology without engineering, but you can't have it without world trade either. So I would like to use the old expression, I don't know if it's from philosophy or where it is, but about necessary explanations and sufficient explanations, where I would argue that engineering is definitely a necessary explanation for technological progress, but it's not a sufficient explanation. Uh, James Watt may have been a genius when he designed his steam engine, but if it hadn't been, if England hadn't been part of the colonial world system of the 1780s, his blueprint for the steam engine would have remained on his drawing board. In other words, in order for that idea to be converted into a metabolic process, involving slave labor on the cotton plantations in America, involving African chieftains who wanted cotton textiles in exchange for their slaves, involving slave owners in Alabama who wanted cheap cotton clothing with which to clothe their slaves. Now, if all these conditions hadn't been there, we wouldn't have had an industrial revolution at least not in England at that time. I'm arguing that the origin of our technological society is based in the political economy of colonialism and slavery and asymmetric exchange. And we're still living with the idea that technology just comes out of ingenious ideas. It's what people do when they design new machines at the technological faculties of our universities. And the economists who occupy a different faculty, they talk about technological innovations as if they just popped out of the blue. They have no basis in materiality, in the material flows of world society. Um, and before I go on with this PowerPoint, I'd like to suggest that this, that this strange 
duality of thinking about economy and technology that I started out with has a lot to do with the problem of dividing nature and society into separate ontological realities. So, although I'm in many ways very critical of Bruno Latour, I have to agree with him in that particular respect, that we have a special hang-up in our civilization about this division between nature and society. I think most of you will readily agree that the economists have ignored nature. I mean, we have fields like ecological economics, we have fields like biophysical economics, we have uh, a lot of people working on what the economists are missing, that you can have an economy grow that finally destroys a planet and the economists will hardly notice it because nature is not part of the economic model. But I would like to argue that the engineers are doing the exact mirror image of that. The engineers think that technology can be developed without any understanding of world society. Now remember, we were talking about the dualism between nature and society. And I'm saying that the economists operate in their minds as if there's no nature. The engineers think as if there's no society. And the latter part of this argument is the most difficult to get across. Because most of us are, by now, after decades of environmentalism, ready to see that the economists are not including ecology in their model of the world. But very few of us will be ready to accept that the engineers are missing something. Because most of us, it doesn't matter what political shade we are, whether we're green or red or blue or brown or whatever, we all tend to believe in technology. We all have technological solutions. It, I mean, solar panels are technological solutions. Windmills are technological solutions. Why do we always grasp after technology? It's like we don't, in, in the heart of our civilization, we do not know what technology is. We do not understand the extent to which technology implicates society. And I'm not talking about society as Austria or Sweden or, or, or any other country. I'm talking about world society because that's the only society we're living in at the moment. It's the only society we have been living in for the past 200 years. <coughs> the Industrial Revolution was a product of world society. We cannot say it was a product of British society. Britain imported cheap iron from Sweden, if I may mention Sweden at this point. And one of my graduate students has figured out exactly uh, how much iron, how much embodied labor and embodied land England imported from Scandinavia, not just Sweden, but Scandinavia in the 1760s just prior to the breakthrough of the steam engine. And, of course, it was very relevant for Britain to uphold this trade because, first of all, land in Sweden was so much cheaper than land in Britain. Uh, you may know that in order to produce one ingot of iron, it requires enormous amounts of forest because what, what Swedes used in order to produce these ingots of iron in the 18th century was charcoal, and charcoal required forests. So I don't, I'm not good at figures, so I can't remember exactly, but I think we're talking about hundreds of square kilometers per ton of iron. And of course, Sweden has a lot of land, yes, so they could export. But you also have to think about the labor that went into this. All the, all the Swedes who worked in the forests and in the mines to produce the charcoal and the iron ore in order to produce all this iron that was exported to England and gave England a basis for its industrial revolution. And then, of course, we have cotton. I'll get back to cotton shortly. And what I want to say is that we're basically talking about the same kind of phenomenon as we have around us today. I don't know if you have ethanol in your cars. 
You do, some of you? At least in Sweden, it's one way of becoming sustainable. Well, let's ask ourselves, where does it come from? It comes from Brazil, from the Cerrado of Brazil. So, in other words, huge areas of Brazil are converted into sugarcane plantations to produce ethanol to make European cars sustainable. And I'm trying to say that part of the equation is that Brazilian land and Brazilian labor is so much cheaper than European land and European labor. I think many of you wear clothes that come from Southeast Asian sweatshops. Well, of course, you know the, you know the situation that we have very cheap labor producing the clothing that we buy and we throw away and we don't even need uh, tailors anymore to, to mend our broken clothes. We just throw them away and buy new ones. Um, what about Chinese electronics? I bet you some of this is made in China. And we know that the average Chinese wage is about 20-25% of the average European wage. Now, I just don't think it's so coincidence that we're consuming so much in Europe and the United States and Japan. It has to do with global price differences. Differences in how labor and resources are priced. And technology is part of this, this whole complex. And I've been trying to think of a way of talking about this. I, I call it the money, energy, technology complex. Some of you may be content with just calling it capitalism. Fine, fine with me. But it's just that capitalism has so many connotations regarding the labor theory of value and the inexorable progress of the productive forces and all the other things that Marx wrote about in the mid-19th century that I'm a bit hesitant about just calling it capitalism. I often do, but I prefer to call it the money, energy, technology complex because it gives us freer scope to think about the system that we're all embedded in. And it gives us the possibility of abandoning the idea that technology must inexorably progress towards higher and higher levels of productivity. And it also gives us a chance to think that labor is not the only source of surplus value. Okay, I'm going to provoke some people here, I'm sure. But I do think that these asymmetric flows of resources that I've shown in the earlier diagrams are also part of the equation, not just labor. Labor is one of them, but we also have land, energy, materials. I'm sorry for this long digression. I've been, you, probably some of you have been reading this uh, PowerPoint in the meantime. Well, I guess this argument is what I've already said, that many modern technologies are contingent, dependent on global discrepancies in market prices. So technologies are not morally or politically neutral. I don't know how many times I've heard people tell me it's not the technology that's the problem. It's what you do with it. Nuclear power is not bad. You know, it's what you do with it that's the problem. So my rather provocative answer would be there is no such thing as technology as such. Technology always implicates a social technical system. Marx believed that the steam engine as such was a good thing. It would be adopted by socialists and it would lead the way into the socialist society of the future. It would emancipate the global proletariat. He wasn't worried about the slave plantations in Alabama that made the steam engine possible. Yeah. The steam engine would have remained on the drawing board if there wouldn't have been those slave plantations. They were part of the global metabolism that made the steam engine possible. He wasn't worried, of course, about global warming. How could he? I mean, at that time, in the 1860s. But what I'm saying is there's no such thing as a technology as such. It is always embedded in a social technical system. And I must give credit to uh, a line of thought that began in around 1987 about this concept of social technical systems. 
you may want to look at an old classic called, a book called The Social Construction of Technological Systems. Some of you may know it. Edited by Wiebe Bieker and some colleagues. And it's, 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 it's the starting point of STS. Bruno Latour was involved in that, those networks. Uh, it's one of the two first chapters on actor network theory. Michel Callon has as, as a chapter and John Law. It's the very beginning of the discourse that many of us now take for granted on, on, on science and technology studies and so on. Uh, okay, now most of us realize that technologies implicate social relations. But uh, I would like to go beyond the case study approach. I would say it's not just a matter of how bicycles are designed or steam engines or something else or microphones or computers. It's about technology as a global phenomenon. And that's why I would like to argue that globally the world economy is a social technical system. Now, we saw the satellite image. That was an image of the world as a social technical system. Now, can I retrace my steps just a little while? Because I've mentioned Bruno Latour a few times, and I, I just recently found out the other year uh, a friend of mine in anthropology, his name is Tim Ingold, mentioned to me that one of Bruno Latour, Latour's first articles was a co-published article with a primatologist by the name of Shirley Strong, uh, which dealt with baboons. I'm sure you didn't know that, uh, you, some of you not, you, that, that actually Bruno Latour studied baboons with Shirley Strong. And he wrote an article in 1987 with Shirley Strong, and something had struck him when he was studying these baboons. He was thinking, what is the difference between baboons and humans? Yeah, that's a relevant question. What, what, what makes us human? And, and he, he was looking at these, for this flock of baboons. They were in the wild, I think, uh, 30, 40 baboons. And they were constantly manipulating each other's relations. They were fighting and mating and, 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 and creating hierarchies. And it was all... He, all Machiavellian. I think he uses the word Machiavellian. It was all about constantly shaping society with your bodies, actually, behaving <laughs> in certain ways vis-a-vis -vis other baboons. And he said, and, and, and then he realized, humans are not like that. <laughs> humans have something else. There's something else that creates human society. And I believe, although he doesn't say it very explicitly in that article, but I believe that that was the origin of actor network theory. That's when he realized that humans had artifacts. And by embedding their social relations in networks of artifacts, you can stabilize, remember that word? Stabilize so social systems with the use of artifacts. Baboons cannot do that. But humans can do that. Look at the satellite image. We have stabilized a global society so that when we go shopping, clothes or whatever, Chinese electronics, it will have repercussions in Brazil, Southeast Asia, China, because of our credit cards, because of our technologies, transport technologies not least. So in other words, all the various billions of technological details that make up our global social world are what stabilize our world. The world is a social technical system. That's why we don't live in groups of 30 to 50 people constantly fighting and mating and, and, and creating society with our bodies. We don't need to. We have credit cards and machines. And this gives, I think, Latour's entire life project an interesting framing. Yes? I have a, a small question. Sure. Because I didn't really understand, or you, you said a couple of times, I don't know if you disagree with the studies on bicycles and the bicycles and steam engines and so on. And then you were referring to the, to the study of coal or sugar cane. And I'm, I'm currently reading this book by uh, Tsing, the mushroom at the end of the world, and she also refers to sugarcane as kind of the stereotype of a scalable crop, 
that is uh, so that is also already the, sh the sugar cane is somehow forms part of the socio-technical system. This is why at this point I would be interesting where do you cut the draw the line between the study of the bicycle and the study of sugar cane. That's very interesting. I want has he seen my review of Tsing? No. <laughs> I, I just I sent Killian a review I just wrote of Tsing's book, Mushroom at the End of the World. So I, I I'm very familiar with that argument. Um, no, uh, actually, I think both make the mistake that they, they uh, I mean, both the, the ancient studies in, in, in uh, this book, Social Construction of Technology, and there's one chapter on the bicycle, you probably know that, um, and the evolution of the bicycle, they both make the mistake of limiting their horizon to a case study approach, rather than looking at the totality, the total metabolism of the world system. So I think it's an inter it's a good question, and, and I think there's it's actually. And then maybe as a hook up uh, or like an okay. additional question because I'm currently uh, concerned with such kind of a micro study. Mm -hmm. So how would you say like I can I cannot picture how to to make a study on a global scale because at some point it always and like <coughs> the actor network scholars also kind of point out that scale is somehow somehow a, absolutely. A, yeah, well, this, this is maybe this is my big problem, you know. How, how do you deal with this? How, I mean, we are so, and not least in anthropology, which is my field, we're so stuck with the idea of field work, case studies, you know, show case, that these abstract arguments that I have provided so far, I don't know, they fall between the chairs somehow. People expect me to go out there and do some field study of how a particular kind of technology, you know, illustrates. But I find I find that extremely difficult. Because how do you say anything about the totality of global metabolism by looking at a particular small technology? I hope that's not my mobile phone. <laughs> no, I Venture technology. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> that was supposed to be a joke. <laughs> okay, I'll just I'll turn this off, don't worry. I don't think it's my wife. I think it's actually somebody trying to sell they're, something. They're all from blinking me. here and they're uh, technology player. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Be careful there. Speaking yeah. about <laughs> the power of the machine. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, Yes, uh, so that, that's, that's a very good point. Uh, actually, my review of Anat Singh is, is too vicious to <laughs> hand around, and I'm still debating with Killian whether I should change my tone. Uh, but that's another issue. We could talk about that. Will you be here for the workshop tomorrow? Or? Unfortunately not, but may, maybe I might change. I promise to talk about Singh. Okay, okay. Um, yeah. Now, th this is a big problem. How do we, how do we scale up from the... The, 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 the very case, the case study approach to the global system. Um, you know, there's actually an example of that in this book that I mentioned, The Social Construction of Technology, is when John Law has a chapter there on the Portuguese expansion in the 16th century. Remember that? Um, he talks about how the Portuguese in the 1500s, they build these caravels, these new ships, and they, they have cannons made out of bronze and they're able to sink all the Arab ships in the Indian Ocean and take over the entire trade. Okay, so this is one of the first examples of actor network theory. And I was particularly interested in that chapter because it applies in a way a world system perspective, right? I mean, here is a European colonial nation that takes over trade in a large area outside of Europe, the Indian Ocean, by using military force. But it was very soon evident to me what the problem was, what was lacking in that particular chapter. And it was actually the metabolic dimension of technology. There's no mention in that chapter of the labor and land and other resources that had gone into those caravels, those bronze cannons. Not one word. It's all about how these ships and these cannons were designed. Once again, you know, the idea that technology comes out of ingenuity. And what I would have wanted to see is how were they able to command all this forest land and all this labor to produce these caravels, these new ships, and these bronze cannons. 
because I would argue that they were the capital. They were as much capital as steam engines for the British 200 years later and, 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 and the machinery for, for the US or Europe today. Uh, they were products of unequal exchange. Um, okay. So I, 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 skipped, I skipped the second last point here. Technologies can organize social relations, we know that, by locally replacing, reorganizing, and controlling labor. It can increase rates of profit. This is a, a classical Marxist argument. It can also serve as tools of military conquest. I just talked about the Portuguese conquest of the Indian Ocean. Uh, you have several books by John Hedrick, one of them published already in 1981 called Tools of Empire, where he shows how military technologies have been used by Europeans to conquer non-European countries. And also, of course, technologies shape human consciousness. And uh, I'll get back to that because there's a very strong humanist critique of technology, as you know. Uh, well, we could start with Marx, but why not start with Martin Heidegger or Jacques Ellul, uh, Louis Mumford, Herbert Marcuse, Langdon Winner. There's a very strong humanities critique of what technology does to our consciousness and to social relations. But that critique of technology in terms of how it uh, deforms the human and deforms our social relations is strangely detached from the question of metabolism, of unequal exchange. None of these philosophers of technology that I mentioned, except Marx, mention technology as a metabolic phenomenon. The rest of them talk about technology as something that shapes our thinking, this new strange technological rationality that appears after the Industrial Revolution. Okay. Um, that was a boring slide, a lot of text, right? This, is, this is, gives us more to think about, and the next slide as well. If, if technology, this is a drawing, this is a blueprint of a steam engine. Now, we talked about technologies as being uh, either blueprints, which would be a necessary explanation of technology, or as being some kind of a societal phenomenon which would mean that it had a uh, societal basis as a sufficient condition. And I realize this is very provocative, but I would say that this is the social prerequisite of the steam engine and the Industrial Revolution. As you probably know, the Industrial Revolution in England was based on mass production of cotton textiles, and it relied very much on uh, import of cheap raw cotton from southeastern United States, picked by um, African slave labor on very inexpensive land that had recently been, well, recently, a few hundred years earlier, had been depopulated. It used to be... Um, cultivated by Amerindians. Most of them, about 90% of them, uh, died as a consequence of the epidemics that were introduced by Europeans. Um, and England, of course, found a golden opportunity using African labor, because the Amerindians were mostly gone, to produce cheap cotton textiles, sorry, cotton, raw cotton for the cotton textile industry. And this was the basis. You probably all heard of the triangular trade, um, where British merchant ships, ships would go down to West Africa loaded with cotton textiles and other British manufacturers, trade them for slaves in Benin and other uh, Yoruba and other West African kingdoms, fill their ships with slaves chained to the floor, then go over to the plantations in the Caribbean and southeastern United States, sell the slaves, buy colonial produce such as raw cotton and tobacco and sugar and so on, and then go back to England. So it becomes a triangle, right? And they very often made six to eight times 
the amount of money they had invested to begin with. So it was a very lucrative, very profitable business. And without this business, of course, the capital accumulation that generated the Industrial Revolution would have been unthinkable. Now, most economic historians today agree on this. Not many people would disagree. But I wonder how many of you, or how many economic historians, would actually think about modern technology in the same way. And you, of course, know why I'm showing a picture from a sweatshop in Southeast Asia. It could have been any workshop in China, or perhaps a sugarcane field in Brazil, or something else. But uh, still, those, those agglomerations of techno mass that I showed on the satellite image are crucially dependent on these huge global differences in, in wages and the prices of labor and land. Um, I, I've been, I had been saying this for so many years to my students that some years back there was a particularly critical group of students who said, well, you have to show us the figures if we're going to believe you. <laughs> so I sat down for three weeks uh, with a calculator and a pile of books in economic history trying to figure out something that the economists never figured out, and I could not find that in the economic literature, uh, that is the amount of labor and land that were embodied in certain quantities of uh, produce that were traded in the Industrial Revolution. So I chose the year 1850. Uh, I chose to look at the main imports to England, raw commodity, and the main export, uh, raw cotton, I'm sorry. The main import was raw cotton, and the main export was cotton cloth. So I chose these two, these two commodities. And I figured out, with the help of my calculator, with the market prices that were ap applicable at that time, how much raw cotton and how much cotton cloth you could buy on the world market for 1,000 British pounds in the year 1850. It's pretty far, actually. Uh, yes, you could buy 11.84 tons of raw cotton or 3.41 tons of cotton textiles. Now, my first conclusion is that these two quantities of commodities are equivalent in terms of exchange value. Would you agree with me that they are? I mean, you can buy either of them for 1,000 pounds, right, in 1850, so that they're equal. In theory, you could sell 3.41 tons of cotton cloth and buy exactly 11.84 tons of raw cotton. So my next move would be to, to calculate how much labor has been invested in those, those volumes of, of, of commodities, and I found that more or less... Uh, 21,000 hours of labor had gone into that quantity of raw cotton, whereas about 14,000 hours of British labor had gone into that quantity of cotton cloth. So already there you can see that the world market would have encouraged, endorsed an unequal exchange of embodied labor. 14,000 British hours for almost 21,000 slave hours, basically, if you want to put it that way. Not too striking, perhaps. It becomes more striking if you look at embodied land, because, as you know, you can't grow cotton in England. And uh, one important aspect of the Industrial Revolution was precisely that it shifted from using wool as the basic fiber for textile production to cotton, because wool you can produce in England, and it did require huge amounts of American land. But by... Shifting to cotton, you could get all, virtually all, the land uh, demands of the textile industry displaced into the, onto the colonies. And this is exactly what happened. Uh, so when, if such a trade would have occurred in the year 1850, it would have demanded almost 60 hectares of fine agricultural land in the colonies but almost no land at all in England, only the space required for a textile factory, basically. So you can see, when I talk about asymmetric or unequal exchange, you can see how a very <coughs> a condition for the Industrial Revolution was precisely 
this unequal exchange of embodied land and to some extent embodied labor. I, I, oh, sorry. Yes, I didn't. I missed it. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, I have to take you back a little bit, but there's sure. something I want to understand. Uh, before, uh, you mentioned that your main criticism of people like Winner. Or a little bit louder. You mentioned that your main criticism of people like Winner or, or Nobert, that they lack this perspective of uh, metabolism. Yeah. And you seem to use metabolism uh, synonymously with asymmetrical exchange. And that this uh, relationship is not very intuitive for me. So could you possibly explain your use of metabolism? Yeah, sure, sure. Yes, uh, good question. And I, I mean to get back to it in a little bit. Okay. But, but it, it is true. Um, I, I, could, I could answer right away to, to, to foreshadow that response. Uh, I mentioned that what I showed in this diagram was not something I could derive from the economic literature. That means that this is not a question for the economist. So, and, and actually, if I, if I ask, I've, and believe me, I, I've, de I've debated with many mainstream economists over the years, uh, neoclassical economists, and I asked them, what is unequal exchange to you? And they would say, nothing. It's not part of our vocabulary. We don't talk about unequal exchange. Um, well, maybe when we talk about monopoly, market power, when some corporations have you know, decided to distort the operation of the market mechanism, then it's unequal exchange, which is something very different from what I mean by unequal exchange. So it struck me as I kept thinking about this that what really happened around 1870 in England, and this is not a coincidence, in the heart of the colonial empire of England, you get a complete transformation of economic thought, the neoclassical economic theory. Prior to that, you had various schools of economic thought that were interested in the material substance of the commodities exchanged. If we go back to the mercantilist, gold and silver, if you go to the physiocrats, land, you know, land was the basis of value. If you go to Ricardo, even Adam Smith, or, of course, Karl Marx, it's labor. So in all these different classical political economy schools, you have an interest in the material <coughs> substance of what is being traded. But with Alfred Marshall, Stanley Jevons, and, 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 and these other people in the 1870s, you get a complete shift to a... a, a, a an exclusive concern with market equilibrium. Output and demand, market prices, it's all money. So I would argue, maybe somebody would contradict me, I would be glad to hear it, but I would argue that at that point, the discipline of economics decided not to look at what was traded anymore, only at the rates at which they were traded, and how those rates were determined by the market. Uh, and I think this is extremely important in many ways, which I will get back to, because we're still living with that. Uh, to put it very bluntly, I would argue that what, what, what these neoclassical economists did in the 1870s, at the height of British colonialism, was to create an ideology by which the asymmetric material flows of the British colonial empire could continue invisibly after the end of colonialism, after the official end of colonialism, you could still have neo-colonial asymmetric flows. So in a sense, we're still living in a European colonial world. Now we have some other centers as well, right? You know, United States and Japan and so on that I showed. But with, we're still living with the ideology that dominated the British colonial empire from the 1870s until its official end. There's no such thing as unequal exchange. I hope to have shown that there is. Okay, uh, we'll get back to that, because I think that this, this transformation of our understanding of exchange is quite fundamental also to our understanding of technology. And I think that what happened in the Industrial Revolution with, with this new economic rationality that was created by increasing globalization and the world market. Karl Polanyi has written very interesting about this in 1944, The Great Transformation, the book by Karl Polanyi, uh, where he shows that the world market was created as an idea during the, uh, during the 19th century 
he calls it the idea of the self-regulated market. And he basically argues, and he, the interesting thing is he was writing at the, towards the end of the Second World War, uh, the same year that the, uh, the leading world powers created the Bretton Woods system, the gold standard in 1944. Um, he, was, he saw that the Second World was approaching an end, and he was trying to understand those past 30 years of chaos that he had experienced from 1914, from the First World War, through the Depression in the 30s, through the Second World War, from 1914 to 1944, 30 years of complete chaos, murder, financial uh, chaos, everything was going downhill. He, Polanyi really believed that the world was about to end, basically. So, um, so uh, and he explained, th this is quite interesting for our current time, because he explained this, these three, 30 years of chaos as the reaction to a long, long period of globalization during the latter part of the 19th century. Does this ring a bell? He was saying that this rampant nationalism, this financial instability, and so on and so on, was all a product of trying to create a world market. So, what do we say after like 40 years of neoliberalism? And now we're wondering about Trump and Brexit and, and other phenomena in the current world. Uh, I think we could go back to Polanyi and understand a lot about what's happening today, actually. Um, I don't even remember how I got into Polanyi you now. <laughs> but probably some question you raised. Well, let's see if it comes back to me. Yes, now I remember. I was just going to say that the technological rationality that developed in the 19th century, uh, and Karl Polanyi deals with this too, in a way. He talks about the machine. And the machine for him is rather impalpable. You really, it's like for Marx. It's, it's, a, it's a productive force that he doesn't say, you know, we can't have them. <laughs> he doesn't say that they are sinister in some way, but he says that they are changing things. They're changing society. Um, and this is exactly the time when we're getting the first, I guess, more or less romantic reactions, humanist reactions to modern technology. Um, and what I will argue is that the kind of technological rationality that we today take for granted uh, that people like Heidegger and, and, and um, Elul and Mumford and, and, and uh, Marcuse and Langdon Winner have all been deliberating about, that kind of technological rationality was born through the market. The market created the economy, and I put quotation marks around it, because the economy was an invention of the 19th century. It was... It was the time when, as, as Karl Polanyi showed, it was the time when human exchange got disembedded from social relations. We no longer traded gifts and services. We created something called the economy, and we created economics, and we created a, field, a, a, a profession of economists who were supposed to study this. The economy did not exist before the 19th century, according to Polanyi. And I would argue that technology did not either. Because technology, again in quotation marks, was something that was created out of the economy. It was the global market that made technology possible. It was the outsourcing, the displacement of resource demands from Europe to other areas of the world that made technological progress possible in Europe. And here we are, still doing the same thing. And not realizing the extent to which this concept of technology is a cultural understanding of our particular mode of exploiting the world. Is it our particular way of maintaining a moral identity, a moral high ground? I mean, we know that there were societies in the past where slavery was common, where feudalism was common, 
And we know that these slave owners and feudal lords, they were the elite of a hierarchy. They were exploiting other social groups. But we also know that they were humans. And they must have maintained some sense of moral identity. They must have gone home to their children and their dogs or whatever and been nice and thought of themselves as being nice. And I'm wondering to what extent we're doing the same thing. I wonder to what extent we're covering up our own highly immoral role in the world as a global elite exploiting much of the world through our consumption patterns and how we're neutralizing this highly immoral position in world society by keeping technology and economy separately and away from nature versus society. Is it our ideology to maintain our moral identity? Okay. Um, so actually what I was arguing, if you go back to this diagram, is that technology could be viewed as a device for appropriating human time and natural space from other social categories. I call it time-space appropriation. Some of you may be acquainted with the work of David Harvey who talked about time-space compression. It sounds quite similar, but I would argue uh, with, not against David Harvey, but with him, that time-space compre time compression is just part of the equation. He shows that people living in Manhattan Island or other urban landscapes, they experience phenomenologically time-space compression. Time is speeded up. Space becomes smaller and smaller. And of course, it's all technologically mediated. But I would argue that in order to have time-space compression as a phenomenological experience in some areas of the world, we need to have time-space appropriation. And I know Harvey would agree with me because he's a Marxist and, and he, he knows that, he talks about capital accumulation by dispossession, right? So he, he knows that these resources must be brought in somewhere, but still he doesn't calculate, he doesn't calculate it. But I think he would agree. So uh, there is, this is one way of approaching technology uh, in, in once, in a way, once again in, a, in as abstract a sense as possible. Have I, have I gone over my time? No, please. Okay. Well, um, <laughs> you sure? We have yeah. okay. talked about one hour. Huh? All right, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think we could think about technology as the unequal or asymmetric exchange of time and space. So we need to ask, what is the rationale of modern technology? And here, I'm not talking about the bicycle or a particular kind of technology. I'm talking about technology as such, as a totality. And uh, to put it very, very simply, succinctly or simplistically, you can choose your own words. I think you could say that technology is a societal device or societal strategy to save time and space for those who can afford it at the expense of time and space for those who can't. Now, I, I usually take an example. When I, the first time I visited Peru was a long, long time ago, 1981. And I'll just, I'll just bring in an anecdote from that uh, trip. I was, I was visiting this uh, agricultural cooperative near a city called Huancayo, and they had, there was a huge, massive Ferguson tractor standing by the side of the road, idle. It was beautiful, <laughs> shining red tractor. And then about 200 feet away, I saw a group of, of young men digging the earth with shovels. And I was young and naive, and I went up to them and said, well, why don't you use the tractor instead? <laughs> what a stupid question. And of course, they responded. You know, hermano, they, we haven't had diesel. We couldn't afford diesel for the past two years. 
and, and we would need some spare parts and we don't have the money to buy the spare parts. And this is one of those moments when it struck me, yeah, technology only works within certain sectors of the world system. They only work where there is purchasing power enough to keep them operating. That's why the massive Ferguson tractor, which was a gift from an American development aid agency, just stood there as a symbol. And they still had to dig manually. Well, we saw the same thing happening basically when, when the Soviet Union collapsed. I mean, there was nuclear power plants that exploded. There was atomic submarines that sank to the bottom of the sea. There were pipelines that rusted. There was a major technological collapse because there was no money any longer. And we could have realized this. We could have seen this when the oil crisis uh, first hit us in 1973. Some of you may have been around then. I was, anyway. Uh, and, but we didn't realize that all the curves were going down, economically and technologically. But we didn't understand the extent to which technology depended on these global prices. But those curves really showed that. But we didn't allow it to contaminate our image of technology as salvation. Instead, everybody frantically started working on solar power panels and, and other possible ways of solving the solution. OK, so to so finish this PowerPoint, I would say technology presupposes differences in the price of labor time and land space. So labor is time land is space. These are two of the most important factors of the production in different parts of the world system. Um, I don't know how many slides I have left, so you'll have to stop me when I'm, when I'm done. I, I can stop anywhere, but <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, well, I, I already mentioned this, that there are, there are some very concrete examples of, of how resources are net transferred to, to certain certain wealthy areas of the world. We talked about Swedish iron, American cotton, Brazilian ethanol, Chinese electronics. Uh, and I also talked about, I ran ahead of myself, I see that. I talked about Karl Polanyi. I talked about how uh, the, the market created, the economy made technology possible. Uh, so let, let's, let's stop at this final point because uh, I, I recently reread a lot of these old authors, uh, Mumford, Elil, Marcuse, not least through the eyes of Langdon Winner. Do you know Langdon Winner? Uh, he wrote a book called Autonomous Technology, and then uh, it was published in 1977, and another one called uh, The Whale and the Reactor. He's was, still, uh, I think... He was here four weeks ago. Was he? Was Langdon Winner here? He's, he's 72 or something now. I was happily surprised he's still active. Uh, I sent him an email a few days ago. Okay, right. I'd be, I'd be really interested to hear what he said when he was here, if he's still talking about the political dimensions of technology. He is, I suppose? He is. Okay, <laughs> right. So I, I would just like to add, because one thing I never found in the work Langdon Winner did back then anyway, in the 70s and 80s, was this global awareness. He, 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 has, he has wonderful examples of how technological artifacts have a political implication, have political implications. Um, but he doesn't include in that argument global, the global market. This is, I mean, if, if you add Langdon Winner's political skepticism toward technology with the understanding that technology is contingent on price, different, price discrepancies, then you have a pretty powerful argument. But I guess it's so powerful that nobody's going to listen to it. You know, it, It'll never become mainstream, simply because it's too subversive, unfortunately. Um, but I, I would like to work on how these kinds of critiques of technology might converge. The humanistic critique of technology and the extent to which technology is inegalitarian um, uh, in terms of, of, of global prices. Hey, how about that? <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, I had some more slides on the money. Do you want me to take them now, later on? Um, 
Shall we open up to questions Yeah, let, let's now? have a then discussion we can, first. Then we yeah, can yeah, the, yeah the I think it's a good idea. So I think we, we have a, a sure. good enough portrayal of the problem um, yeah. Alf is presenting to us. Now we'll open up to questions and then afterwards, uh, what is so great about Alf's uh, work is that he is also actually offering quite concrete approaches towards a solution and we'll, we'll go okay. into that later. We'll that, yeah. The first question was here, it's already here for half an hour, then okay. we have here and here and then, okay. Mm -hmm. I'll ask you, because I had it, when you had the, the slide where you um, got ahead of yourself, uh, oh, yeah. go back to it, the one with the... Um, There's a microphone if needed. Do you have the microphone or shout or what? Oh, I was microphone. also asked, yeah, this is recorded. Can you hear me? Yeah. Is it working? Yes. Okay. Uh, I was asked to say, this is recorded, if you don't want to be recorded, don't use the microphone. Was this the one? <laughs> no, no, no. It's the one where you had the uh, chart. And then in Bobby Land, and you had zero for the factory. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And I wanted to ask where did you put the embodied land that was used for making machines, that was the technology that ran the factories, and also was there embodied land in the energy source? Is that not included here, or is it included somewhere else if you went further on with that? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the structure would be the same. If I, for example, would have used raw, uh, iron ingots here, for example, now. Uh, in 1850, they were no longer importing that much iron from Scandinavia, so I wouldn't have made a case for it. But, but I really focused particularly on cotton here, only cotton. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, next question was here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Lecture. Question would be: How do you how do you see the science? The science conference, it's, a, it's not part of your energy, money, technology trial. Could you please repeat that? I'm, I, I have sciences. hearing aids, you can't yeah. see them. Yeah. The science, how do you see the sciences? The, the role of that science, please? Behind, I mean, because behind technology, you have, you have the scientific world system. Yeah. How do you see that? How do I see the... The role of the sciences in, in this whole... The role of the sciences? Yes. In the exploitative system of the world. Yeah. Um, I think science, to the extent that it explores nature, what is out there, what was there before humans came, thermodynamics, for example, are extremely relevant and valid, and it's interesting, we need that kind of knowledge, or I wouldn't have been able to figure out these biophysical flows, for example. But the problem is when science becomes engineering, when science becomes technology, because then, I think technology is intrinsically, engineering is intrinsically contingent on not only nature, natural science, but also society, social science, but the, the engineers don't, are not aware of that, or they don't uh, acknowledge it. So I'm not saying that science is deluded. I'm saying that when technologists, when engineers use natural science knowledge and say that the implementation of this knowledge is simply about revealing the mysteries of nature, and it's got nothing to do with society, they're missing out half the equation. That would be my response. Uh, I think I'd like to continue with that. Um, my own position would be to say that engineers do not understand nature fundamentally. Mm -hmm. Because everything that functions has to be measured and nature cannot be measured in its totality. And I would argue that the systems we use are essentially not able to do that. Um, by extension, that includes the human being. And so um, I think I'm trying to add to your discussion perhaps at a, a global level that has to do with the identity of every human being. If you say that this whole system does not actually understand nature or human beings, 
then you end up with a system that could never actually fulfill humanity's existence. And it becomes temporary. And it becomes a kind of a collapsing situation that, that um, runs toward its end sort of asymptotically, perhaps. But one, uh, I work from a different angle. I'm an architect, and I work with uh, leveraging the difference between architecture and technology by questioning the means and the ends so that architecture's ends are completely different from buildings' ends, which means that architecture defining itself by a technicist proxy is completely going to fail. I mean, it's failing now. That's the reason. Um, I was just reading about robotics today, about autonomous cars. And in terms of that political idea that you're using, wouldn't we be heading to a more granular uh, colonization now where the robotics actually does that very same thing to each individual, creating a whole new dimension of uh, difference, taking much more directly from the human being, whether it's your phone or your car or anything, that uh, metabolism that you're talking about. Mm. If you add that dimension of nature being completely not understood. Mm. OK, thank you. I think I've understood the question now. I would not be as pessimistic about our grasp or the natural scientist's grasp or capacity to understand nature as you are. Um, I mean, we did make it to the moon. Uh, so some, they must have got something right. Uh, we did build steam engines. Uh, we must have known something about thermodynamics. Can I add to my the simple way to put it is that we don't use nature's means, knowledge, consciousness, um, awareness for our knowledge of nature. We think a way about nature which has nothing necessarily to do with nature. A device that we've created so that science and technology are a device which overlays nature and arguably and demonstrably has no actual knowledge of what nature is doing or trying to do. It's superficial and partial, because what we can't measure, we don't take into account. But, but you're attributing to nature some kind of a characteristic or, or feature that natural scientists have failed to grasp. There's something that you have grasped about nature, apparently, that all these millions of natural scientists have not grasped. And, of course, I'd be curious in knowing what that is. If you can put it into words, or... It's, if, you, if you consider that... Uh, how can I put it? Nature, I mean, we create a body of knowledge which we excavate from ignorance, from not knowing. Our economy of knowledge is dependent upon that ignorance. That ignorance is something that we created, or that economy, we created it because we don't know everything. Mm. And the idea that we're going to know everything by measuring it seems to me impossible. So it's about um, circumstantial proof. Yeah. You see, I think the problem, as we will talk about shortly, is money and the economy, not the way natural scientists understand reality. Uh, and let me give you an example. I had very recently, it's the first time I published myself in a, in a natural science journal, uh, the European Physical Journal Plus. I don't know if any of you are acquainted with it. I wrote, I wrote in that issue, uh, the a recent issue about biofuels from my own experience, not as a physicist, but as an anthropologist and as an ex-farmer, a spare time farmer. I have spent decades since the 1970s, raising sheep, raising beef cows, growing crops, and so on and so on. And I've seen the Swedish countryside completely transformed. And one thing that really, really baffled me was back in the 80s sometimes when people started planting willows on fine agricultural land. Salix, S-A-L-I-X is the Latin name, willow trees, bushes. And I know that my ancestors and me myself had been working hard to get rid of bushes from our field. 
But all of a sudden, you know, this was the thing to do because you could produce energy from these bushes. And I, I was very skeptical. I was thinking, how could you possibly get enough energy out of this field to, to, to power all these machines for, for chipping and harvesting and, and combusting these willow bushes? I, it seemed ridiculous. And so that article is really about the global distributional politics that went into that. Only Swedes and other Europeans could ever imagine planting bushes on their best agricultural land, while people in South America and Africa are starving, trying to get hold of a little, little garden to grow their vegetables on. Now, this is an aspect of global political economy, and it ties in with technology. And this whole discourse on biofuels is very weird to me. And to put it very, very simply, I would argue that what we learned in the late 18th, early 19th century was that we could run steam engines on coal. And now we're trying to run combustion engines on horse fodder. And that is a very weird development. I mean, it's as weird as trying to run a horse on coal. Uh, we lived in an organic regime up until the Industrial Revolution, and we know today that it's much more efficient to feed a horse with the oats that you can grow on one hectare of land than to feed it on the than than to than to to run a, a, a machine on ethanol produced from one hectare of land. You can get more horsepower, literally out of oats than you can from ethanol or, you know. So, so technologically, we have this lock-in that engineers still think we need to build a combustion engine that uses food or fodder, products of our agricultural land, instead of fossil fuels. Well, why not just go back to horses? You know, it makes people laugh. But horses are more efficient than tractors, particularly if you run them on ethanol. Okay, that was my point in that article. I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know what, what the people are going to say about that article. I think two year, one year. Her, she was first. So, you actually define technology when you start. Good. So my question is. What, what for you is technology? Because if a farmer in the Middle Ages built a water wheel yes, in yes, yes. that's also technology. Yes. But my actually more important question for me is if in a utopian world everybody were living more or less in equal circumstances, economically speaking, mm -hmm. would there be no more technological development? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, oh, that second question is really tricky, I, I, but I'll, I'll try the first one. Um, okay, that, that's a very important question. I'm sorry I missed the definition of technology. Um, some people put the question to me, what about Paleolithic stone axes? Are they not technology? Haven't people always had technology? Yes, but my point is that something happened to our very concept of technology through the Industrial Revolution. Because prior to that, you know, say, 1880, 1890, uh, technology was merely about ingenuity. You could, if, if you could figure out how to make a, 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 an axe or, or a shovel locally, with local labor, local resources, and you were ingenious, you were practical, you were smart. We have maintained that definition of technology while the phenomenon of technology has been transformed. Because starting with that steam engine, or around that time, technology became contingent not only on practical knowledge and ingenuity, as it had been for millennia, but also on the world system. So that when I talk about technology, and I sometimes try to qualify it by saying globalized technologies, Technologies that, for their very existence, are contingent on price differences. That applied to the steam engine. It certainly applies to modern things. Um, but it didn't apply to 
the windmills in the Middle Ages or the Paleolithic axis. But you're very right. I should distinguish between technology one and technology two somehow. It's very difficult. I wish I could come up with a word for this new phenomenon of technology that appeared in the late 18th century. We shouldn't confuse that with Paleolithic stone axis. <coughs> the second question, that is really a tough one. Um, I, I, can't, I can't imagine. I mean, I, I think people will always be creative, but they will have a different condition for their creativity, different conditions of rationality than if they can buy cheap labor and resources from Brazil or China. They will have to spend their creativity and their ingenuity on local resources and local labor. That's actually the point of my, the econ economic model that I would argue on. Um, I mean, if we go back to the 1930s, the Depression, I, 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 I wasn't alive then, but I, I've heard stories about how people would, would plow up their, their lawns and, and, and plant potatoes, how they would run their cars on, on firewood instead of coal and so on. In Sweden, we say yen gas. I don't know what you say here. But um, so, so I usually think of that. It was a financial collapse, but it really illustrates our creativity, the incredible human capacity to create when they need to. We don't need to today. I mean, we live a very comfortable life, most of us. But I think the moment we will need to, uh, we will be surprisingly creative. And I, I don't think human creativity will not stop. Is that enough of an answer to yeah, this? That's what I think too. Okay. Right. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Yes. So um, I agree with many of the things you said. I'm coming from natural sciences. Okay. So one thing which shocks me a little bit, though, when I sit here, is that there, first of all, the dissing of the the engineers. Now. And so far, I understand you're an anthropologist, social scientist. So why is the responsibility of the engineers to grasp the complexity of the world we live in? That's the first question I have. Um, I find it difficult to understand why the engineers should be able to understand this, which most other people don't know. And the, the more present or in your embodied land, do you, how do you deal with our present day discussions on ecosystem services and mm -hmm. things of the sort, which is something we deal with on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. But um, I'd like to hear your mm -hmm. opinion of that, because we're really putting market labels on everything. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Now, the first question, I'm, I'm sorry if I sounded like I gave the engineers the full responsibility. Not at all. Not at all. No. Uh, I would give actually more, at least as much, responsibility to the economists. Uh, I, was, I was arguing that the economists and the engineers have diametric or mirror image worldviews. They somehow complement each other, in each in its own way, ignoring one of these polarities, society versus nature. Uh, and I, I, of course, I can't even say that it's engineers and engineers. I, I don't want to put the blame on any category. Because, I mean, we're all part of this gigantic illusion. And, and uh, I mean, most, I know a lot of engineers and economists, and they're very nice people, and I'm sure they're not trying to fool us. I mean, they, 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 they believe in what they're doing. Uh, I'm just talking about, at the societal level, how, how our worldview becomes a veil, a mystification of reality. Uh, not because somebody is evil, and sinister and trying to fool us, but because this is the most comfortable way for a British colonialist in the late 19th century to accept the fact, perhaps like David Ricardo must have done, that he had made a fortune on the slave trade and accept it without feeling that he was morally guilty in some way, but instead invent a notion like comparative advantage, you know, uh, invent an abstract rhetoric for, for hiding your own moral responsibility in the world? I mean, David Ricardo did not write the lyrics for Amazing Grace. But I'm told that the person who wrote the text for Amazing Grace 
had been a slave trader for all of his life until he was converted and wrote Amazing Grace. So I'm saying uh, David Ricardo must have had some other way of mystifying his own role in the world system. And the colonial economists, the stock traders of, of the late 19th century Britain, uh, must have had theirs. But it, it, it's a societal logic. It's a bit like, I don't think Foucault put the, put the blame on anybody. You know? it, power and knowledge is so connected without giving, without sort of attributing guilt to any particular professional category or person. It wasn't so much if I just say it without the microphone loud enough. Sure. It's not about attributing blame. <clears throat> I'd like to hear how would you envision society to deal with the complexity? Because what I'm surprised is coming here is that something I've been fighting against, or I, I keep speaking out against, is the silos. We have all these silos. You're an anthropologist, you have the economists, you have the engineers, and I find these silos here in this room again yes. today, yeah. and that I found worrying. Mm. Yeah, well, I, I completely agree with you. And you see, it's, tr it's true that I did my PhD in anthropology, but since 1993, I have been working uh, as chair of a division on human ecology in Lund, and it's extremely interdisciplinary. So we have uh, natural scientists, so economic historians, anthropologists working together as a team. And uh, in our courses, that I had to teach, we have to read all kinds of stuff that anthropologists would not. So, so interdisciplinarity is extremely important, I think. Now I remember you, you, I remember you had a second question on ecosystem services, and I'll try to be very brief and say that uh, to me, ecosystem services and the, 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 the valorization or the evaluation, the assessment of ecosystem services is, a, a, um, is very misguided. It's, it, it's very similar to what the environmental economists are doing when they're putting a price on nature. Uh, and of course, nature cannot be, and, and here I agree with what you were saying about quantification. I, I, you're not with me. But, but <laughs> uh, that, that uh, it's impossible to put a price on nature. <laughs> And unfortunately, the notion of ecosystem services comes from a very interdisciplinary uh, field, ecological economics, but it still uh, falls into the same pit, uh, you know, uh, of, of trying to assign monetary values to, to biophysical phenomena. And I completely agree, that's not at all what I think we can do. And, and I know that a lot of people, and, and this might bring us over to the next discussion, but a lot of people will think, well, if, if money, is so detached from the real material flows, shouldn't we make money reflect the material flows? You know, that's the first question that comes into your mind. And my response would be, it's impossible. It's impossible. How can you do that? I mean, just look at the second law of thermodynamics. We know that uh, uh, entropy increases as utility increases in the system. So how can you possibly have money that, that sort of is aligned with the second law of thermodynamics. It's impossible. So my model for an alternative economy is not about getting money to reflect biophysical resources. It's about safeguarding the biophysical material security of human beings uh, without trying to have an energy theory of value or something like that, which I think is completely misguided. Was there any more? Oh, yes. Thank you. Um, thank you for that uh, uh, presentation. And don't get me wrong, if I say many of these things I heard again, I heard already in the 70s. Yes. Or in the early 80s. I, I was a student in the 70s. Or in the early 80s. <laughs> so it's not to say that it is uh, outdated or no more relevant. It's just to say the contrary. Yes. Yeah. But, and we could drop many names of uh, mm. Andre Gunter Frank, mm. exactly. of Rutta Do, yes. Samir Amin. Yes. There has been a whole yes. discussion, a whole, I mean, a whole school of thought, mm. which, uh, and I would also mention the, the whole discussion about uh, appropriate technology, mm. just to say that mm. engineers have thought about these inequalities very early on in the 70s, this, this, this fact that uh, technology is totally uh, is, 
distributed in a very un unequal manner is not new. Mm. Um, so many of the things are not new in what you said. Of course, they are very new and interesting things, new sophisticated statistical tools, tools which you use, which provide more evidence, which we didn't have in those days. No. But my question is, why did it disappear? Why did we fall back? Why did all this, why have we regressed in this discussion? Why is all these things now, for many people, more or less new perhaps, which were 30 years, 40 years ago, not new at all? What happened? What actually happened? So there's, maybe there's one, one thing which is that people realize that they run against the wall, that they can't change it. And if you don't, you don't like that feeling that you cannot change things, you know there's something wrong, but you cannot change it. So you probably turn, you prefer turning to other things which you yeah. think is more accessible to solutions. So this is, can be one reason, but there are of course many other reasons that I would like to have your take on that. Yes. Why did it happen? That is a very profound question and, and as you can understand, it's been bothering me for, for decades. And yes, I'm still stuck in the 70s, you know. These, these were the ideas that I was raised with when I was a student in sociology and anthropology in the early 70s. And André Gunde Frank was a good friend, by the way. I dedicated one of my books to his memory. Um, yeah, very good question. Why have these things disappeared? I, I think there are two ends to the problem, and one has to do with power and the other has to do with existence, identity. And um, somehow there is an unholy alliance between power and our own um, insistence on living meaningful lives. Mm. <laughs> and I think, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's very difficult to um, to confront a situation where we do not see, as you said, a solution. Because, and, and I think for me, I need to hold on to the solution. So please don't puncture it later on. I need to hold on to the solution in order to hold on to the problem analysis. So I think this is, this is what has happened. That in order to accept a certain description of the problem, there has to be a solution. And if you can't present a solution, you're going to reject the analysis of the problem, which is turning things upside down. Because I do think that academics should be allowed to do one, but not the other. Academics should be allowed to analyze a problem and say, I don't have a solution. But somehow, they're not allowed to do that. They have to provide a solution, then the newspapers will listen to your analysis. So for me personally, it's been very important to try to work also, as Kilian said, on how do we transform this system? If it's so basically warped, you know, how could we transform it? And that's where I um, have been working on an alternative economic model. I don't know if that responds to your question, but I think there's a, there's a strange connection between our desire to believe that we're living in the best of all worlds and things will get better as soon as we get those solar panels and we're really not exploiting people. Well, maybe we are right now, but you know, in 20 years time we won't. And we have thousands of rationalizations of being an elite in the world. And our need to live with ourselves is connected to the power elites need to have us saying certain kinds of things about technology, about economy, and they don't want to hear these kinds of things. So there's a connection between our, uh, the necessity of us to find meaning in our lives and the necessity of power to keep power. That would be my response. I think since we already had almost a perfect introduction to your Okay, solution, let's look at solutions. Let's yeah. go there. <laughs> um, well, we'll how are we doing? I mean, uh, people are getting tired, aren't you? You don't seem to. So. Um, okay, I'll, I'll try to be brief about this and, and then... Um, 
And once again, stop me if I get too long-winded about it. Uh, as you can understand from what I said before, I, I believe that uh, a very big problem is the way economics work, the world market works. Uh, and uh, so it's quite predictable that I have tried to work out uh, another kind of economy. Let's see, I'm going to pass very quickly through... Uh, Let me ask you a question. Oh, sorry. You always exclude politics. Pardon? I'm missing the term politics. You're missing a... The term politics. You always talk about economy, but you never mention politics. Is it included? Oh, yeah. You mean like uh, politicians or decision making, stakeholding, mm. etc. Et yeah, yeah. Well, they're bedfellows, basically, with the economists <laughs> and and the engineers. So I, I didn't make a distinction. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, what I, what I would argue is when I use the word power and politics and political. I'm talking not about party politics, not about you know making career in politics and getting into parliament and stuff. I'm talking about uh, you know controlling, having power, having power in various ways, having power over discourse, uh, including discourse and economics, of course, and discourse and engineering. But but you wanted me to talk more about uh, well, there's one very obvious thing I could say about politics. Now, if we should come to a conclusion that Europeans and Americans and Japanese, in order to become more on a par, more egalitarian with the rest of the world, would need to cut down on their consumption by about 90%, I would not want to be a politician saying that. I would not get very many votes. Would you agree with me? Okay, so, I mean, that's why I gave up on politics a long but time ago. I relate to your title of this lecture, it's called Machine as Machinations. Hmm. So, how would I understand that? I don't need a microphone. Okay, well, yeah. Um, yes, but the problem, I think, is that even if some of us could agree, and I think increasing in numbers of us, but probably no more than 5% or something in Europe agree that we radically need to cut down on consumption in Europe, that there's no way that we can technologically or, or, or you know, universalize the kind of consumer society we have in Europe. In that sense, globalization is an illusion. Uh, Bruno Latour, I'm sorry for mentioning him again, but he wrote, he wrote a good article in Le Monde uh, just after the American elections, where he was uh, reflecting on, you know, the choice between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. And he basically said, okay, uh, and I guess he was anticipating the French elections. He was saying, we have two models. We have the globe and the nation. He spelled them with a big G and a big N. And uh, we should know by now that neither of them is possible. Both are utopias. Globalization in the sense of, you know, making a world of 60s, in the, you know, Scandinavians basically, Europeans, uh, is impossible. Uh, the people who work on ecological footprints say that if all the people in the world had lifestyles like Europeans, we would need four additional planets. You've probably seen figures like that. Okay, but still, uh, a majority of people are talking about free trade, globalization, and so on and so on. Commons. Pardon? About commons, for example. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, and we know for other reasons that the old idea of the nation is also something we have to reject. Uh, my argument would be that maybe an alternative economy could help us find a third way beside the globe and the nation. Bruno Latour doesn't offer a third way, but uh, I think it's money that forces us to decide between the globe and the nation. So um, we, we, we really need to transform the economy. Now, I don't know if this is an answer to your question about politics. If you could draw a picture about this machine as a machination, how would, how would it look like? 
the machine as a machination. How would you draw it on the wall? Oh my God, I'm not an artist, you know. Oh, come on. <laughs> but uh, maybe that's an interesting, uh, interesting challenge. Uh, you'd need to draw a steam engine that somehow included uh, cotton-picking slaves in Alabama and, uh, you know, uh, African chiefs buying British textiles in, in, uh, in West Africa. And it would be a huge machine spanning the entire world. What an interesting presence. idea for a piece of art, right? Yeah, but the presence. Oh, the present? Yes. Oh, it could be done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Art. Oh, I'm sure it could be done. <laughs> Good point. I wish I'd gone into art. That would have been really interesting. Yeah. Sorry I can't answer right away, but I think it's a challenge. It could be done. Yeah. It's a great idea. Actually, I have, I have uh, people who are suggesting that they would like to make a, a kind of a board game. You know what a board game is? It's like um, Monopoly or, you know, when you move pieces around and throw dice. A uh, board game out of my book, The Power of the Machine. I think that's excellent. How to make a, 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 a you know a social game out of a book? I don't know. It's a similar kind of challenge. Okay. Um, Excuse me. It, it touched it touched briefly on uh, the experience of, of time and space in bigger cities and how this is like interdependent. Uh, uh, please, a bit louder. Maybe you can take the, the mic. Experience of time and space in bigger cities. <laughs> you you like, talked briefly about the experience of time and space in bigger cities. And I wonder whether you could like sketch out a bit more like how this is inter in interdependent um, with the experience of time and space. And okay, um, I would I would like to. Uh, there, there's a book by by David Harvey called The Postmodern Condition, where he discusses. Uh, he's very much into architecture and art and, and and design, and he's got a lot of illustrations in that book, where he shows that living on Manhattan Island in the 1980s was uh, implied an experience of time-space compression, as he called it. And basically what he meant was that everything was speeded up so that everything went faster. And that meant that space became smaller. Which is clear. It's like so many people are there. Like, and such yes, a well, it is, it's obvious. But, but how is this interdependent with how people experience time for how time-space compression is dependent on time-space appropriation? Yeah. Okay, right. Okay, my argument would be that in order to have the technologies that you had in Manhattan, say in the 1980s, the elevators that made you go from uh, the bottom floor to the 30th floor in 10 seconds and so on and so on, in order to have that technology you needed an enormous ecological footprint. You needed to have people mining the metals for the elevator, bringing in the energy for the elevator, and so on and so on. All the physical resources. It, I mean, let's put it this way. Time-space compression is a technological product. It's a result of technology. You can't have it without technology. Is it? I would argue, yes. I would say yes. Manhattan would. Manhattan is a huge machine. But if you would put people in this room, wouldn't they experience like a time compression? Well, Vienna is a big machine. I'm sure you use uh, transport technologies every day, whether it's cars or subways or whatever. You have mobile phones. I mean, you're all part of, of this urban modern lifestyle or postmodern lifestyle which is so contingent on technology. And if I, my argument was that technology as such is contingent on appropriation of resources, then the logical conclusion is that any kind of phenomenological consequence of this modern technology, like time-space compression, is ultimately contingent on time-space appropriation. That would be my response. W was that OK? Thanks a lot. All right, all right. Solutions. 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 <laughs> oh, the solution, yes. Oh, sorry, I, I, I lost my track, yes. Okay, uh, I'm going to skip very quickly through uh, some... This will be tomorrow. Uh, yeah, here we are. If the solution is not technological, what might it look like? Okay. It's coming in a second. Oh, I, I just... sorry, I'm reading to myself here. Yeah, there you are. Uh, <laughs> Redesigning money. 
Yes, and uh, I can say right away that if what I'm saying now will sound completely incomprehensible or unrealistic or crazy or whatever, uh, it might be, but then I invite you to look at a piece I just published in the Journal of Political Ecology. Unfortunately, I don't know the issue, but it was the last issue, it was now 2017, and it's called How to Turn an Ocean Liner. And uh, I, I'm trying to sketch the system that I will be talking about now for a few minutes. And in that article, I, I've been talking about this for so many years that I, I tend to get a lot of questions about it. So what I did was I wrote this article in the form of 25 FAQs. Do you know what FAQs are? Frequently Asked Questions. Okay, so that article is basically 25 FAQs on this economic system. So maybe one of you will give me a 26th question I'll put into the next article. But it's very important for me to get criticism, so I really want you to think hard. What have I missed? What I'm suggesting is that uh, we need to have two currencies. Two currencies. Okay? Uh, we need to, let, let's think about this, let's, let's begin by thinking about this possible reform as a national reform that is being implemented by a nation state. So, yes, some of you are going to be disappointed that I'm relying on the nation state. I have to remind you I'm employed by a nation state, I, I am very um, uh, chauvinistic about nation states, and I don't believe in these grassroots initiatives that dissolve as soon as people get tired of them, which has been happening to these local currencies for so long now that I want to suggest we have real authorities backing up what I'm suggesting. Okay, does that sound very conservative? I think it did. Okay, anyway, what I'm suggesting is that we cannot, we, I don't believe in a Bolshevik revolution. I have enormous respect for the Marxist edifice and I, I basically count myself as some kind of Marxist, some kind of Marxist, not a classical Marxist perhaps, not a 100% Marxist, but maybe a 80% Marxist, but of course it's very difficult to be, be an 80% Marxist because usually you're, you're excluded, you know, you're, you're not a Marxist anymore, okay, but anyway, uh, well, I don't believe in a violent revolution. I don't believe in it. I don't think we're going to do it. Uh, but I think we could transform the economy towards a post-capitalist economy by giving people more options, more choice in their daily life. And that means not prohibiting capital accumulation. Not going to Wall Street and saying, shut down Wall Street, we're not going to accept this anymore. I think what we could do is to undermine financial speculation by creating a new money. Now, I wish we had politicians, here's politics, that are courageous enough to back this up. And by the way, I don't believe they will until we really have to. So. I think we may see more financial crisis than we had in 2008 before this system becomes even possible to debate among politicians. Um, but my point is this, that to put it very, very succinctly, the nation state could provide all the citizens of a country with a basic income that's the first component. But that basic income should not be in ordinary euros, ordinary currency that can be used for anything. It should be in a complementary currency uh, which can only be used to buy products and services that have originated within a certain distance from the point of purchase. So, for example, I don't know how much agricultural land you have around Vienna. It looks like quite a lot. Mm. Yeah. So, if you 
for example, had a local currency and each of you received every month onto a special plastic card a certain sum of money in this currency but you know you knew you couldn't go buy computers or microphones or any other globalized things with it the way people do in Bristol or Brixton you know they have Bristol pound and Bristol pound these transition towns currencies but instead of restricting the currency geographically and saying you can only use this in Bristol, you can only use this in Brixton, you can only use this in Vienna, I don't think we, we can't go back to the Middle Ages. It would be just impossible to administrate an economic reform which went back to local currencies in that sense. But instead of restricting the applicability of the money, we could... Uh, geographically, we could restrict what you can buy with the money. Now, in Bristol today, and I was actually just reading an article on this. Uh, have you heard about the Bristol pound? Yeah. Now, it's supposed to be one of the latest examples of community currencies. There have been community currencies around ever since the 80s, you know, the less local exchange trading systems and so on and so on. And nowadays, most people just shake their heads and say, oh, it's been tried, it doesn't work. And I agree, let's and so on don't work because they have not analyzed the problem. You could actually use the Bristol pound and go to any shop in Bristol and buy stuff from Japan or California. Now, in other words, the Bristol pound, which is supposed to encourage localization, does nothing really to contradict globalization. Because as long as you can bring in global produce into Bristol and spend a local currency buying global products, it's just a meaningless show. Now, what I'm arguing is that this alternative currency or, 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 or complementary currency, I've called it notes here, you see, um, can only be exchanged for locally prod produced goods and services. Uh, now, let's say, for example, that in Vienna, the distance would be 50 kilometers. Um, that would define local produce. How could we administrate that? It wouldn't be difficult. You all know what GPS is. We can cert we today we certify products as being fair trade or organic or you know vegan or non-vegan, and we have all kinds of certification schemes. Why couldn't we transport certified commodities? Certify that these potatoes have been grown within 50 kilometers from the shop that they're sold in, in Vienna. And that means we could only use our local currency, we could use our local currency to buy that. That means, if you think of this system uh, as a more expansive model, it would mean that a number of local products, and not just products, but services, would be marketed, uh, but purchasable with, for this local currency. And all of us would have so much of it, we wouldn't know what to do with it. We would receive, let's say, let's say at the start, I mean, this is just a, a fantasy, but let, let's say we received around uh, 500 euros, the equivalent, sorry, the equivalent of 500 euros each month in notes and we would be we would be we would have that money and we could choose whether to throw it away in a waste paper basket and say oh we don't need more you know paper coupons uh, or we could realize my goodness I all of a sudden have 500 euros to buy stuff with that I would otherwise have used my regular income to I would buy potatoes with my regular income right but by using that local currency, we would actually free up quite a lot of our regular income to buy this local stuff. 
So as a local cons individual consumer, I would not throw those coupons away. I would use them because they are fiat money. And of course, not just for potatoes. Over time, you would expect a number of local businesses to develop. I don't know if you have a lot of shoemakers here in Vienna. Uh, in Sweden, they're almost gone. You really have to look for shoemakers. Why? There are shoemakers? No, no, not no. Okay, you have okay. If you have shoemakers, yes. Yes, okay, okay. It does, it does prompt a question. Well, okay, could you hold on to that just for one minute? Uh, what I'm saying is that I think that this would stimulate a lot of local enterprise that we don't have now. Uh, tailors, shoemakers, uh, carpenters, uh, farmers, uh, vegetable growers, uh, caretakers, transport companies who are all willing to be paid in notes. Why would they be willing to be paid in notes? Was that your question? No, no, okay. That's one of my 25 FAQs. Because, one, they have the option of converting a certain quantity, a certain proportion of their income in notes to regular euros through the authorities at a rate set by the authorities to compensate for the loss of tax revenue. They could also use the local currency to buy local labor and local produce. So that, well maybe I should, I should go to another slide to, to, to illustrate what I'm talking about. Yeah, this makes it more tangible, I think. What I'm suggesting is that the authorities issue these notes, they distribute them to the citizens, the households, the households can ex exchange them between themselves or in relation to various kinds of local businesses that I think would pop up. The businesses can choose to either recycle them in the local community or uh, convert them to, to regular <coughs> notes. As you will understand, this idea is impossible to anchor among economists. But I am not daunted by that. Uh, I think it still has a lot of merit. And uh, if I may just continue with a few more slides before you raise questions. Uh, some anticipated questions, and these are only three out of 25. Locally, by locally produced, I mean goods and services originating within a given radius from the place of purchase. How is the new currency distributed? by each month charging plastic cards with electronic points. Isn't this just another local currency scheme, like the Bristol Pound, like Let's? No, this proposal builds on their failures for over 30 years. The article that I was reading on Bristol Pounds uh, showed that of the citizens of Bristol, 0.4% of the populations were using Bristol pounds. <clears throat> now, if all the citizens of Bristol or Vienna were given this sum of local currency, it would not be a marginal affair for 0.4% of the population. It would be something that involved uh, everybody, basically. OK. Um, Isn't this the same as what we had before? We had the euro, we had lots of currencies. Or if you look in history, you've had areas that had their own currencies. No, it's not How the is same. It, different from that? it is different because, uh, as far as I understand, the currencies that were complementary to the euro were never restricted in terms of geographical extent. There was nothing saying that you could only use um, what was the Swiss currency? Uh, francs. Could that you could only use the franc within fifty kilometers? But did people use the francs to buy things in Austria? Did they buy, use francs to buy things in Germany, ordinary people? To buy cars from Japan. Well, of course, we all have national currencies. Actually, we still do in Sweden. We don't have the euro. We have the krona. So, but, but that's something very, very different. Because with the krona, I can buy stuff from anywhere in the world. And I'm sure you could with the franc as well at one time. But what's to stop me using my local currency to buy stuff from anywhere in the world? <laughs> Pardon? I go in the shop and I say, I'll give you these notes and you can give me that second-hand laptop. No, wait a minute. Why can't I do that? With this new system? 
Why would anybody, why would any owner of a computer store accept local currency for the computer? You can change them, you told me, you can take them and change them. Well, maybe the Fed, the authorities could see to it that it wasn't that attractive. Maybe your computer seller would rather receive ordinary money, euros, for his computer. So then there would be no possibility at all of somebody cheating in the, in the sense you mentioned. Because the government would maintain the prerogative of setting the rate at which the notes could be converted to euros. I'm skeptical for this, this simple reason. I look at Britain now. Britain has just changed its pound coins because there's so many fraudulent pound coins. So many, something like, I don't know, one, uh, one in five is, is believed to be fake. Um, Italy has produced eight or nine machines, factories have been raided for making fake euro. There's always been counter So counter I money. don't see how the people would be honest with this money. I think they'd be just as dishonest. Okay. The, this is a very common kind of question. I should add it as number 26. <laughs> so, there will be some kind of criminal activity. <laughs> oh, why don't I stop that too? You know, there is actually things like that going on now, right? I mean, you mentioned what happened in Britain now. How should I, with my idea, be able to counter Everything that's wrong with the economy today? No, I, I, that, that doesn't apply to my system. Okay. Okay. You don't think it would undermine it? Pardon? It wouldn't undermine it to a sufficient extent to make it unworkable. But what, 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 in what sense is that argument about making counterfeit money an argument against this model? And not against the model of the British economy today? Oh, I'm against that one as well. Okay, as well. <laughs> All right. Okay, then I'm with you okay. completely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Here, here, okay. many here. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah. If you want the microphone, we have to. Yeah, just do it. Yeah, just do it. <laughs> um, I have a technical point and a more general point. Yeah. The technical point, of course, the locally produced is a is a tricky one because yes. for the reasons perhaps we have already mentioned, but of course there is already this. Uh, in, in, in today's yes. global trade, mm. there are these clauses of origin. Mm. Yeah, you, would, you would have to introduce, take your shoemaker, is he allowed to use imported leather? That's a very important somewhere? question, yes. Or is he in, in allowed to yeah. use machines yeah. produced mm. in somewhere? Yeah, that's, so that's he does many things uh, which even even the person uh, uh, growing, <coughs> growing potatoes mm. probably will use Tractor. input from outside. Mm. So that is a, 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 a not so easy. You would have to no. come up with bureaucratic rules and, and control these rules and so on. But that is probably feasible. Let me put the more general things. We all, I don't know, perhaps people get angry if I say that, but. Uh, there is at least some statistical evidence that poverty in China and in Vietnam has gone down as a result of global trade. That at least is what many people believe. That's what the economists say. That's what the economists say. Mm. And it is also a reality that poverty in absolute terms has gone down in these countries I just mentioned. Mm. And it is also a reality that these countries have very much built on global trade. So what I want to say is your system seems to suggest don't touch global trade, leave it as it is, and do something on the local level. I, I'm, perhaps I've misunderstood. Yeah, no, I, I don't think that would be the consequence. But, but I, I, I do believe that the global trade system as it is is, of course, with many flaws and needs to change urgently. But it, I do also believe there are ways to make it, to transform it, reform it, make it more equitable, which I think you should perhaps include into your system to, to make it a kind of a transition scheme. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll start with the, with the final question because the first question is trickier. <laughs> um, I don't agree with the economists that the world is getting more and more fair. 
some uh, countries. Yeah, it's yeah, but, but okay, let, let me just argue my point. Uh, we know that inequalities in the world are increasing. Uh, we know that 1% of the world's population owns, since 2015, as much as the 99 remaining percent. It's the old trickle-down argument. We know, we know that eight men, and they're all men, by the way, own as much as the 46 poorest percent of the world's population. You've all seen figures like this. So we have a, 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 an obscenely unequal world. And I don't think the economists are going to help us to produce more egalitarian society. And although, when it comes to this issue about whether world trade is good for the poor or not, I have, I'm very, very skeptical for various reasons. For one is, one is I've heard that there have never been more slaves in the world than today. Which surprises us, because we all think slaves belong to the past. But in, in absolute numbers, there have never been more slaves than today. The source of interest. Pardon? The source of that. Oh, yes, I wish I had it by heart. Uh, anyway, there's, a, there's, there's one uh, good book called... Uh, well, my, my brain cells are getting old. It's called Blood and... something. Oh. I could email it to you, probably. I have it in my shelf, I don't mean, which is all about modern slavery. And I have, I have seen uh, you know, reports on, on, on the slave contracts that bound people in Brazil to the sugarcane plantations, producing the ethanol that we import to Sweden and so on. So, How do you define slavery? Pardon? How do you define slavery? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, well, these people in Brazil were, were, were tied to the land through contract. They could not leave the land, and their... They were paid in, in, in kind from the company store. It was, you know, they were, they were really tied. They had no way of getting away from there. So the police had to go in and actually free them up because they were so far in, high in, in debt. You must remember that debt is the most important source of slavery and was historically too. Uh, David Graeber showed that 70% of the Africans who were transported from the uh, from West Africa in the 1760s had become slaves through debt. They were not captured in war. They had become slaves to financial debt. And this goes back to ancient Mesopotamia. So uh, uh, it's not difficult to become enslaved today. Um, okay. But I shouldn't be arguing with Hans Rusling. Some of you are aware, are aware of his work. You know that he passed away some weeks ago, and it feels wrong to, some months ago, it feels wrong to debate with him. But uh, when, when he was alive, I did debate with him quite a lot. Uh, not only because he was a Swede, but because he had a very different perspective on, on global development than I did. And you've probably all seen his, his, his uh, YouTube talks where he shows how uh, health has improved in most, most countries, and we just have to continue you know, improving health and so on. Uh, and he has another YouTube show where he has seven yellow dolls, each representing one billion people, and they're the world population. And he says, this one here can afford to fly. These two here can only afford the sandals they have on their feet. These two can only afford bicycles. This one can afford cars, and so on, and so on. And they're all standing in line to improve their welfare. They're standing in line. And our job is to see to it that the line, the queue, advances without destroying the planet. Very pedagogical, yes. But for me, not enough. I must say, Hans Rusling was an excellent pedagogical resource. He was a medical, he was, a, he was in medicine. He was not a social scientist. He was not a historian. And the questions I would have put to him was, why did his historical graph begin at a point when Africa had been suffering through 300 years of European colonialism? It's not strange that they had a low water mark at that year and that modern medicine has helped them up somewhat. But we have to think what did Europe do to Africa in the 300 years before Hans Rusling started discussing their development? 
That's the historical part. The other part is about social science and those yellow dolls. If you, if you think of those yellow dolls, if you think about humanity as a queue, as a lineup, waiting for more money, more resources, then that's fine. That's not my view. My view is that there is a relationship between the dolls, between the one who can fly and the one who only has sandals. And the reason the one who can fly can fly is because the other one only can have sandals. There is a social relationship between the dolls. They're not just lined up. They are part of a global society. And this is what Hans Rosling unfortunately missed. He became one of the hundred most influential people in the world, a very close friend of Bill Gates. No wonder I say. No wonder I say. The multi-billionaires of the world will have friends like that who say those things. This goes back to your question about why, why do we say some things? Why are some things acceptable to say and some not? It's not acceptable to say that we're living in a highly unequal world that's going to collapse. No. But it is acceptable to say things are getting better. Yep. Just a little more technology and a little more growth, things will get better. So that gets back to your question. But I've already forgot your first question. This was the shoemaker using leather from... from yes, right, right. That is one of the trickiest questions of that, that, that whole discussion. Okay, see. Um, I think, I, I, I haven't figured that one out. Uh, but I, I, do, I do believe, I, I don't think it's, it's feasible to restrict uh, a farmer and say, you can't have a tractor. You have to grow your potatoes with a horse or by hand. I think you can't do that, not to start with. But I have an intuition that in the long run, it will be more rational and more efficient for the farmer to use local resources and local labor than to buy diesel and tractor parts from the other parts of the world as a result, as a consequence of this economic system. So what I'm arguing is that, that, that uh, the long run effects of a system such as this would undermine those multinational corporations. Somebody said something about, but you don't want to undermine global trade. But I think this system would. Because if, just imagine, how many people are there in Vienna? 1.8 million? If all of us had the equivalent of 500 euros each month to spend on local produce, that would radically decrease the demand on long distance transport, right? <laughs> If we could buy our stuff within 50 kilometers and our services, why would we buy stuff from China or Brazil or somewhere else? I'm saying that if this system was implemented, and it doesn't require any coercion, it doesn't require any revolution, it just requires us to get more choice in our daily life. And if all of us together started using our notes we would create a completely different economic rationality that would undermine the capacity of multinational corporations who today give us Walmart, who ship us food from across the other side of the world, who ship us fossil fuels, who speculate in money as they do on Wall Street, and so on. It would undermine the power of these national corporations who today live and subsist on globalization. And I think it all begins with us as consumers, but it begins even earlier because it, it begins with what kinds of conditions are we given for becoming sustainable. Today, the most rational thing we can do is to be as unsustainable as possible. The most comfortable way for me of coming to Vienna was to fly here. The most rational thing for any of us to do is to be unsustainable. We're just too comfortable with that so far. But this system would make it rational to be sustainable. That's the whole idea with it. It's very difficult in a little, little while to explain the points of it. I have things like this. Why would we want to deal with notes rather than money? Uh, and you have to ask about the different kinds of actors, the households, the businesses, the authorities. Uh, you have to ask what would be the point of doing this? 
and I would say it would increase sustainability, it would reduce vulnerability, it would diminish inequalities, and believe me, I have a long list of advantages, but I won't bore you with that. But if anybody is interested in this particular way of thinking about how we should transform the economy in the name of justice, sustainability, and resilience, you may want to look at my article in the Journal of Political Ecology, last issue, How to Turn an Ocean Liner. Um, because there I have all the details of this argument. But there, I'm sure there are more questions about this. Or maybe you just want to go home. <laughs> maybe. Yeah, what about you? <laughs> About, about you, because you spoke before like the good of living revolution and like a violent revolution and I understand but to me it's again the problem of the transition, right? Because how do you imagine the transition of what we have now to a system like this? And because this kind of it's always the problem because it's nice to imagine a nice social system that could work. Yeah. But how are we going from the point that we are now mm. to this point? Exactly. Yeah. Like well that is of course the big problem. Uh, and we're, we're back into politics. And, and I would say more or less what I said before, that I, I, I'm, I'm actually, even if much of this sounds very unrealistic, I'm realistic enough to realize that it's not something that we're prepared to do now. Uh, I think we really need much more problems than we have now before we can seriously start discussing a financial um, uh, reform like this. And uh, frankly, I'm not sure that the problems are that far off. I don't want to sound like a you know, doomsday prophet catastrophist, but I think the financial problems we saw in 2008 are just be the beginning of the problem. Um, the, the financial debt of the world doubled between the year 2000 and 2012. And if you look at graphs now, you know, they go like this. And you wonder how long this can continue. Okay, you can borrow new money, Greece can borrow new money, the states can borrow new money, but how long is that possible? We all know from our private economies it won't work in the long run. Uh, and then, of course, we have the whole problem of climate change, and, and we have the rising inequalities with everything that that brings along in terms of global politics and, and contradictions. So uh, I, I'm not, I don't see a rosy future for this civilization, really. And I think that, that uh, we need to have some kind of preparedness, some kind of understanding of how we could build a sustainable and even a pleasant society. Uh, if I may shift just very momentarily to what this might mean for us as, as individuals, uh, we have to remember that to get, to get a basic income every month that we could survive on must be a lot more edifying for us as persons than to go on unemployment money to be unemployed and discarded by the system. Uh, this system would actually make it possible for anybody to take a choice whether to choose to survive on their basic income and spend their time playing a guitar or painting or doing something creative, or whether they would have to become a proletarian in Marx's sense and necessarily go down to uh, the cash machine at Walmart's to pay for your rent and your food every day. Now, do we work to survive? We do today, but this system would mean that we can survive without necessarily taking a normal job, normal conventional job. So I think it would mean very much for community identity. People might start cooperating, helping each other out at a local level, using these notes. It would recreate a sense of community that Many of us look back to nostalgically, of course, skip all the poverty and stuff. You know, we don't need that. But community, we've lost community. So that would be my response, I think. Okay. Do you don't think the whole thesis is uh, dangerous for you? Pardon? What? It's dangerous for you as a person. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't get your question. Dangerous. It's dangerous. Dangerous. Do you think this is dangerous for you? To person? say this? Yes. No. Because <laughs> I come from Latin America. I know. I know. Um, you uh, made some formulation like that. Mm. It could be dangerous. 
Yes. And I know some people that are no more here. Yes, you're right. You're right. I, it's because uh, slaves, it's because they are. Mm. So that many people that you said there's 90% mm. or more that live in that conditions to support the other people to live in other conditions are not because they want. Mm. They are forced to. Mm. And for some people who think maybe not so clear, yeah. like a global idea, mm. Mm. but in home situation, I don't want to mm. make or to have that life and always see that in other point parts of the world mm. is really they are really so smart, smarter than me, mm. and then they, they start <coughs> to ask or to make questions. And it's dangerous for them. Yeah. I, I completely agree with you. I've been traveling in Latin America, as you know, and, and working in Peru and, and Brazil. And uh, I would perhaps hesitate to give a lecture like this in some countries there. Yeah. I, 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 I understand. Uh, the conditions for political critique are very different in different parts of the world. Um, I guess what I have relied on so far is that nobody in Sweden cares what I say anyway. <laughs> and the ones who care don't even understand what I'm saying. So I keep getting research money and I've got a job. And <laughs> hopefully somebody reads me somewhere. But the, the situation is very different from Latin America. But I understand precisely what you mean, how these are politically very volatile things to say and, and you can only say them in certain contexts. And that's why I do appreciate uh, the freedom of speech we have in, in, in some European countries. I do, yeah. And I, I think it's... It's horrible to think that it's even dangerous to say these kinds of things in some Latin American countries. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is part of the, the same reality. Yeah. It's part of that globalization. Yeah. Some people have to be, have mm. to live in that version. Yeah. Because also, not like that, mm. also doesn't work. It's also an economical yeah. and political question. Yeah. I have um, a friend who, he, he, he did his, he worked at, He's now in Brazil. Uh, Felipe Milanes is his name. He's been working in Brazil on, on the violence that has been exerted towards extractivists who want to stop illegal logging in Amazonia. He, pre he did a thesis in, at Coimbra. And uh, he's a very courageous person. He's been around all over in Brazil and interviewing and so on. Um, and I know in Brazil it's not easy to criticize the, the, the system. And of course in Colombia and so on. And when I was first in Peru in the 80s, you know, it was a time of the senderistas and so on, and there was a lot of violence, and sometimes I was traveling around in some parts of Peru where I shouldn't have been traveling, and um, I guess I'm happy today that I didn't know then what I know now. Yeah, but I mean also, this is not only in Latin America, mm -hmm. so this is uh, similar in Africa or Africa, yes, yes. but also in North America, many yeah. people lost the job. Yeah. If you think different, if you try right. to make something on the local way, on the other kind of thinking about the money, mm. or professors also in, in, in Swiss, yeah. well, you know, problems when they speak also something like that. I, I, I know also in Europe, when yeah. you start to up, make more political yeah. that question. And God knows where we're, where we're going. I mean, you mentioned André Gunder Frank before. Do you know that there was a long period when André Gunder Frank was not allowed to enter the United States of America because he was too associated with Allende and Chile and so on. And he was, you know, a major academic and very important uh, theorist of, of world systems, depend dependency theory and so on. He was not allowed into the McCarthy era United States. So, you're right. Um, there's a lot of politics in this. And we're once again back to your question about power and so on. Yeah. Okay. I think the time is approaching it must to be. split into maybe more individual discussions. Well, um, so if your questions are not too urgent, maybe we can talk in a smaller circle because there's already a lot of movement in the room. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, so... Thank you so much okay. for this Thank you. very insightful. <laughs>